Welcome back, everyone. As our first panel highlighted, many universities are considering their particular responsibility as institutions of higher education to reckon with their histories and engage in reparative action. Few have contemplated this responsibility as deeply as our first keynote speaker. She once said, I came to university life because it was the one space that I could see in the country where one could begin to tell the truth. Throughout a long and distinguished career, she's led universities to fulfill what she's described as their vital role, turning a mirror to society. It's my honor to introduce Prairie View a and University President Ruth J. Simmons. Okay. Thank you. No, Thank you. <laughs> Ruth's accomplishments in higher education and leadership are extensive and I couldn't hope to do them justice in this brief introduction. I, I was tempted to run out the time for this entire session to do so, <laughs> by the way, but I will share some highlights. She's the daughter of sharecroppers in segregated Texas. She has dedicated herself to charting a more equitable and inclusive path for the next generations of students. Ruth's own path in higher education began with a scholarship to Dillard University, where she earned her bachelor's degree summa cum laude, before going on to earn a PhD in Romance Languages and Literatures here at Harvard. Ruth then joined the faculty of the University of New Orleans as a professor of French, followed by multiple roles on the faculty and administratively at USC, Princeton University, and Spelman College. She became president of Smith College in 1995, where among her many pathbreaking initiatives was the establishment of the first engineering program at a women's college in the United States. In 2001, she became the first African-American president to lead an Ivy League institution at Brown University. During her 11-year tenure there, she continued her decades-long work advancing equal educational opportunity. Under her leadership, Brown expanded its faculty, bolstered its curricula and facilities, increased financial aid, and instituted a need-blind admissions policy. As we have heard about today, and we will be hearing more, I am sure, Ruth also led Brown to establish a committee to examine the university's involvement with slavery making it one of the first in universities in the world and the first Ivy League institution to formally acknowledge those ties. Ruth assumed her current role as Prairie View A&M University President in 2018. She has received many, many honors. I, I'm tempted to list some of them, no. but it goes on and on. <laughs> Let me just say it would be easier to list the honors she hasn't received than the ones that she has received. And there are all these big ones. Uh, she is very extensively decorated, and we are very proud to have her with us today. After her remarks, Ruth will be joined in conversation by another path-breaking scholar, Henry Louis Gates, Jr the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and American Research at Harvard University. Skip's contributions and achievements like Ruth's are too extensive to list. He is a literary scholar, cultural critic, journalist, and filmmaker. Skip has probably discovered that I have a little boilerplate I used to send him every time he gets a new honor, which <laughs> tends to be once a month. He has authored or co-authored more than 20 books, the most recent of which is Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow, and The Black Church, 
This is our story. This is our song. An Emmy and Peabody Award winning filmmaker, Skip has hosted and produced over 20 documentary films, including The Black Church on PBS, Black Art in the Absence of Light on HBO, and the long-running PBS series, Finding Your Roots. Skip is also the recipient of numerous honorary degrees and awards. I, I won't mention his either, except to say he is a member of the first ever class of MacArthur Foundation Fellows. Uh, numerous boards, numerous honors as well. After Skip and Ruth's discussion, we will turn to audience questions. Now, please join me in warmly welcoming Ruth Simmons and Skip Gates. Good morning. Do you mind if I stay here to deliver my remarks? It's up to you. OK, thank you. <laughs> Again, good morning. I am. Um, have to confess to feeling somewhat overwhelmed to be back here on this occasion, particularly uh, to speak about this subject. I can't say that I'm going to be faithful to my remarks because as these feelings flood in on me, I feel moved to be honest with you about what I'm reflecting on in this moment. So I apologize. Well, no, I don't apologize for that. <laughs> um, I was actually reflecting on a question um, posed earlier. Uh, and I was thinking how very right and just that I'm back here doing this, because in so many ways, the work of this university sends us out into the world to do the work of justice without necessarily knowing it that I was able to come here and to spend time at Harvard so many years ago as a young person, believing in the potential to use whatever I learned here to serve the world. And now I'm back and I've been doing that. I, I don't know why that didn't occur to me before. Mm. But, um, but thank you. Um, uh, it means a lot to me to be able to say that um, I, I did something good with what I did here. You know, everybody in my community was thinking, what in the world are you doing? You're up there. I mean, you could be back here in Texas <laughs> eating barbecue. and You're wasting your time up there at Harvard. You'll never really amount to anything um, when you, because you're studying, for God's sake, French. Um, and black people don't study French. What are you doing there? And so a lot of people gave up on me because I didn't choose um, sociology or law or something very practical. Uh, and I remember Morley Safer asking me, why on earth did you focus on French? <laughs> and my answer to him was quite simply, because I could. Mm -hmm. um, and so the empowerment of learners to do what they love and what they, they value highly, knowing that it's going to lead them somewhere, is one of the best things the universities can do. Mm -hmm. So you see, I've already departed from what I was <laughs> going to talk about. <laughs> I want to thank Dean Tomiko Brown Nagan and President La uh, Larry uh, Bacow. I was going to call you Lawrence, but um, for the invitation to come to this conference. And I certainly want to commend members of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery for their extraordinary work. When we began a similar undertaking at Brown University in 2002, I thought the climate at that time was somewhat inhospitable for tackling such a fraught question. But I actually think that 20 years later, such work is perhaps even more challenging given the organized efforts to oppose truth-telling about slavery. Mm -hmm. 
that are now sweeping the country. And so my hat's off to you for taking this on in this environment. Uh, one of the most difficult, uh, I think, I've experienced. Devotion to the work of truth-telling lies at the heart of our work in the academy. We should never forget that. Reasserting the importance of independent and transparent inquiry and reminding us of our highest purpose in teaching, learning, and research, this effort demonstrates the integrity so necessary to garner and retain the trust and respect of those we seek to serve. So again, thank you all for taking this on and wrestling with one of the most difficult questions in our nation's history. The existence of American slavery still awakens stark and rancorous political divisions, and its legacy in this country still sours hopes for meaningful inclusion and justice for minority citizens. Of course, while the subject of equality and justice remains deeply important for descendants of slaves, it's actually just as important to every American as the prospects for a unified and peaceably governed nation will forever elude us if we do not address this legacy and its continuing impact on the lives of so many so very many in our country. Some argue even today that the history of slavery in the United States should be buried and forgotten. Enough has been done, they say, to ameliorate the sins of slavery. Equal opportunity programs and formal desegregation efforts played a decisive role in providing minority access to educational institutions like Harvard two professions and white collar employment, but predictably an ever more robust backlash has led to a call to, dis to dismantle preferential policies that favor women and minorities. That enough has been done to address racism and discrimination is an assertion that appears to have gained momentum, especially during those among those disaffected by their economic status and resentful of what they perceive to be opportunities lost because of these special programs. I hear this all the time. You know I'm a Texan, and I live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I practice my profession in Texas. I get funding for my institution from the Texas legislature and the governor of the state of Texas. That's the world I live in. Hmm. And I relish being able to be there hmm. and to speak to them about these issues. I don't think they relish my being there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we know, um, these complaints are a pungent motif in right-wing ideologies and play really a central role now in national politics. Perhaps the anger and misapprehension aroused when the les legacy of slavery and discrimination is evoked is entirely understandable. I was telling Skip earlier that when I announced at Brown that we were going to do this work, a, a very good friend of mine, uh, outstanding scholar, Nellie McKay, called me up and said, girl, have you lost your mind? <laughs> and she was a friend. <laughs> um, after all, people feel this way because rituals of forgetting were not only long supported throughout the country, but they were endorsed widely as an important patriotic aim. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address focused on, quote, the great task remaining at the end of the Civil War, which was, of course, above all, to preserve and heal the Union. Um, by forgetting the massive, massive moral ill that inspired the war in the first place. Putting aside a forthright critique of slavery and a calling to account of those who violated the humanity of human beings may have seemed urgent at the time, but the legacy of false or incomplete histories has left us with an acute sense of betrayal by lies that benefited certain segments of society. 
Restoring the painful missing elements of these histories is, I believe, a necessary and heroic act that upholds standards of truth, fairness, and frankly, moral behavior. When I, I think when I, as a kid, how uh, imagine now being in a deeply segregated part of the country, um, having migrated from a plantation to the city, uh, and listening constantly to messages about how unworthy I was, how ugly I was, how I would, could never be anything. Um, that universities seem to me to be these magical places. Because for all the lies that surrounded me, I knew there were places dedicated to truth. And so my flight to academic life was really all about looking for that space somewhere in the world where the truth could be told. Apart from the question of whether the imprint of massive and systemic human rights abuses could ever be permanently erased, there's also the fact that forgetting can never forestall the resurgence of certain aspects of memory, experience, and belief. In the end, falsifying the nature and import of crimes against humanity minimizes the extent and import of the injury. The deliberate untruth that goes on year after year, era after era, creates actually a viral new evil that may be in some ways worse than the original evil, and that is the erasure of the moral obligation we have as human beings to address the legacy of such deeds. I always think about it that way. The longer you wait to address that evil, not only are you more complicit uh, in that evil, but you have a new evil that you've created. Mm -hmm. um, the evil of the continued denigration of victims. The evil of the lasting effects of these acts of inhumanity and brutality on successive generations. When I think about it now, I think, when I, when I think of my grandchild and the future she will have, and I think what, how different it could have been if only people had seized the opportunity earlier mm -hmm. to deal with these issues. And yet we know there are children who will be living out the nightmare that we've given them for many. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being a little depressing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> no, I'm gonna get out of that. You're okay? telling the truth. Um, in the end, by failing to explore critically the existence and consequences of such actions, we consign ourselves to incomplete knowledge of who we are mm -hmm. as moral beings, the reasons for our actions and beliefs, and how we can change to improve upon our future. In 2001, as I was preparing to assume the Brown presidency, a group of scholars and activists, including prominently Professor Charles Ogletree, raised questions about how certain institutions benefited from slavery. Now, I have to say that in the Brown community, there was a lot of panic because somehow Brown's name was mentioned by Ogletree and others as one of the main offenders. Um, they argued that these institutions might owe a debt as a consequence of the benefit they received from slavery. So in response to questions at the time of how to deal with Brown's purported slave legacy and a lawsuit that would name Brown as a main beneficiary of the slave trade, I commissioned a process to engage our community in considering how Brown was specifically tied to slave trading and whether Brown had represented this history accurately. Uh, I was quite naive. I went about asking people, uh, what is this all about? I just, ar just arriving at Brown. What is, uh, is this, is, what is this about? Do, do you know what this history is? And I was told repeatedly and officially, Brown had no ties to slavery <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> no, I, and I believe that they were convinced by this. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we designed, in effect, a community, res well, I, I have to confess, I did go to the PR person and ask that question. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have done that, right? <laughs> so, so we designed a process to try uh, to find out what the truth of it was, because nobody seemed to know. It was all hidden. It was erased from books completely. Um, we knew from the outset that since race and slavery are the third rail in US political discourse, whatever we found, and however we carried out this work, reconciliation of divergent perspectives required really diverse involvement as well as maximum transparency. The findings of the Brown Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice revealed that many of Brown's incorporators owned slaves and benefited financially from the transatlantic slave trade. This really wasn't all that difficult to find out because after all, this was the epicenter of the ship mm -hmm building and, um, and everybody's hands were di dirty in that area at the time. Everybody was tied financially in some way to slavery. The founding president of Brown himself, James Manning, who was sent from Philadelphia to come to the university to found a Baptist university finally for this country, hmm was a slaveholder. These uh, facts had long been omitted in any published histories. Uh, and as I was beginning to learn about uh, this along the way, I really had to ponder um, how I could react myself personally um, when certain facts were disclosed. For example, the, the desk at which I worked hmm. Uh, was um, Manning's desk. Hmm. Um, and every day uh, I faced his portrait right in front of my desk. And people repeatedly ask, you're black. Uh, your ancestors were enslaved. How, how can you sit at his desk and how can you face his portrait? That caused some necessity for me to think about that. And I'm glad that I had an opportunity to do that. In the end, I thought, how satisfying it is <laughs> to be able to sit there in front of those portraits, right? No, but, no, but seriously, this is, this, is the, this is the magic and the magnitude of what you're doing. You're involved in a process that creates exactly those kinds of dynamics. Would Manning ever have contemplated that um, a descendant of slaves would be sitting at his desk and facing his portrait? Probably not, but all of us should consider that that is the way society evolves. If we're lucky, mm -hmm. and if we keep learning to be better at what we do, um, then that's exactly the way it's supposed to work. Questions about how the university might have benefited from its colonial era founders' involvement in the slave trade could have been debilitating. Could have been, easily. To the sense of pride, if nothing else, that so many have in what? Brown identifies itself as the most progressive certainly of the Ivy League, mm -hmm. and they might even say in the country. <laughs> and here you have this messy problem to have lied year after year, decade after decade, about involvement in slavery. What does that do for your sense of? Mm -hmm. But in confronting these questions, we found actually an opportune moment to communicate the depth and significance of our scholarly mission and our commitment to present day justice. Mm -hmm. As principled adherents of empirical science and critical thinking, universities that fail the test of truth telling about their own actions may justifiably prompt questions about the ethical basis of their scholarship and teaching. Mm -hmm. We want it therefore to demonstrate a high standard of scholarship in our committee process. 
So the committee delved into rare archival material readily at hand due to the scrupulously preserved records that the Brown family had donated to the university. They were a very intellectual family. They kept records of everything. And it's all there in the library at Brown. Committee members poured over and exhibited for the public personal correspondence, ship's logs, and other primary materials revealing the sordid history of the Brown family's involvement in the trade. Not the entire Brown family. Um, John Brown, the most infamous of them, um, and the most dedicated to slavery. Um, I was kind of an odd experience, I would say, in a way, because my house at Brown, uh, which Larry uh, and Adele visited, um, was across the street from John Brown's house. Hmm. Hmm. And um, across the street from John Brown's house was another of the Brown family's uh, homes. So we were surrounded by um, the stories of the Browns. And innocently, they had handed all of that over to us so that we'd be able to discover uh, all the records of the slaves that had jumped ship, um, of, uh, of cruelties that had been um, carried out. Uh, all of that was readily available. Of course, once we got past the facts of this history, the central question really remained. Given that history, how do we today feel about it? And what, if any, actions does this history prompt us to undertake today? That's actually the most important question. Mm -hmm. That's the question you're all going to have to continue to deal with. Reaching back in history to judge how historical figures acted and judging them in the context of more evolved and enlightened laws and human rights protection can be a treacherous undertaking. It can also consign us to an endless succession of accusations and revisions that detract from the urgency of current current behaviors and problems. Yet insight from history is undeniably critical to solving current problems and preventing future abuses. So one can be sharply divided over what is required of us today in view of the actions of our founders, but one should not turn away from the question of what to do. For in choosing how to react today, we are ourselves creating an historical legacy and forging a new narrative for which we will be judged in the future. Ignoring what we know to be true condemns us in our turn to harsh and unre unrelenting criticism from those who come after us. This truth finding is, I believe, then, a process that is essential to the enlightened evolution of modern day society and its diverse institutions and communities. In receiving the committee's report, I wanted to return to the essence of the charge that I had issued to them before they started the work. Getting this right was about the university's reclaiming the fullness of its responsibility to represent a critical perspective with regard to history, including its own history. If there's anything that the Brown process did well, it was to model how ably, and perhaps how uniquely, institutions like Brown and Harvard can and should take on difficult and even divisive issues. A lot of time in the course of this when people ask him, well, why? Why? Are you? I would answer the same way. Because we can and because we should. We must never apologize for being that site for this country. Because where else is it to occur Amen. if it does not occur here? That's our, that's our most important. So I, you know, I believe still that universities model the best of civic and intellectual engagement, addressing fraught issues, expressing objectionable views in a civil environment, asking challenging and uncomfortable questions, formulating useful solutions, and developing enlightened 
community consensus. Since the publication of the original Brown Report, as you know, many universities uh, and institutions have followed suit, emulating the Brown process and working to unearth their own ties to slavery. In this sense, the story of slavery in the United States is, is really still being written. Mm -hmm. The opening of the African American Museum on the Washington Mall, in which the story of African Americans in the United States is represented through art, artifacts, and history, is in some ways the most powerful statement yet about our nation's responsibility to come to terms with the history of slavery and African Americans in the United States. I was so pleased to see that I think Kevin Young might be here at some point. There are many signs that we're getting to the nub of the fallout from the way the aftermath of slavery unfolded. Numerous groups are now calling for significant changes in the way we are organized and in the way the public policy is designed. One of the most often used terms in our political lexicon is transparency. The insistence on an end to politically motivated fabrications, to secret governance structures that give preferential treatment to select groups, and to hegemonic assertions of racial superiority has become a standard in political discourse. I hope that this standard would ultimately advance inclusion and redefine public expectations of behavior across the racial, ethnic, religious, and political spectrum. A particular focus on longstanding university practices, traditions, and iconography, a particular focus is, um, is uh, the way in which universities have glorified acts of injustice and discrimination, including those that originate in slavery. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we extract ourselves from all of that, because every university has um, a good supply of outrageous uh, genu genuflection to immoral characters um, because of the um, gifts to universities, um, because of the involvement of so many different people in the life of universities. And yet, um, that work is going to go on. It is going to go on because people will demand that it go on. Um, in our discussion, I might want to come back to that because I have some very odd thoughts about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Significant concessions are being made to address excoriating critiques of practices that appear to honor corrupt and morally compromising behavior. With new centers, increased financial aid, sensitivity training, curricular expansion, rewritten university histories, monuments to victims of discrimination and racism, and so on, have been hastily approved to assuage the demands of activists. Such actions suggest a moment of collective rethinking of institutional narratives that perpetuate erasures of collective and individual complicity in unethical acts. I should tell you that uh, the committee uh, issued numerous recommendations. The Corporation of Brown declined to comment on those recommendations and left the decision to me. The most important uh, recommendation, the most meaningful to the committee was actually that Brown issue an apology for slavery, uh, for its slavery connections. Uh, I refused. Uh, I refused principally because I could not imagine as an African American apologizing for the university, hmm. uh, for the university's ties to slavery. And, um, and just as uh, some people, when we started the study, thought that the process was naturally corrupt because I was African American, mm -hmm. um, and thought that the process would ultimately lead to recriminations of all sorts and a call for reparations and, of course, uh, presuming that because of the color of my skin, everybody knew what I was going to think about the outcome of this. Well, we live with that every day. But still, the idea um, of 
um, being the apologist for this was too convenient uh, a narrative, and I refused to do it. Um, uh, um, they had many good suggestions, um, many of which we endorsed. Uh, one included a physical representation um, for the campus, public art, uh, which if you visit uh, uh, Brown, you will see on the front lawn um, a piece uh, by Perrier. Um, uh, that is a result of this uh, study. Um, in the United States today, the narrative that governs our union is being reshaped and redefined. It is being reshaped by commercial and nonprofit institutions. It's being reshaped by newly diverse communities. It's being reshaped by those who would wish to have their say one way or other. Whether or not we're able in coming times to cohere collaborate, share power, and forge a common direction will depend on whether the kind of process uh, that you've undergone here comes to be a more accepted mode of forging a common direction where all stakeholders get to view the process and standards for telling a common story. I'm immensely proud of what Harvard is trying to do under the leadership of President Bacow. I think you all need to understand how difficult it is for a president of the most vaunted institution, perhaps, in the world. Perhaps. <laughs> um, to do something that doesn't have to be done, um, you can enjoy um, the benefits of being um, the president of such an institution, and um, your life can be perfectly wonderful, um, but to take on the commitment to expose yourself to the criticism that he's going to get as a consequence of undertaking this work uh, is something to be acknowledged. But more than that, it's something for you to support. Because a, a, a president who does this um, uh, will have some difficulties. He, he doesn't know about all of them yet. but. Um, <laughs> But um, when, um, when I was taking on this work at Brown, uh, the fact that I was African American obviously uh, was a bit of a problem. Um, that's when I, I think I was telling you earlier, that's when I got my security detail. Um, uh, I think that you have to be prepared uh, to stand up. Uh, there's nothing so wonderful in my experience, uh, at least, and I've lived a very long time now, so uh, I say this with some confidence, there's nothing so wonderful as to remember those times when you actually did stand up. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, is, um, it is wonderful to attend a conference. It's better to do the hard daily work of supporting um, actions that create a better world for us all. So remember that and remember to stand up and, and support people who are doing this kind of work. But I want to say that Larry, when I was a new president at Brown, we, we saw, started um, at Tufts and Brown around the same time. Um, uh, and at that time, when he was a new president, he and his wife reached out to me in, in those days. That hand of friendship has remained outstretched to me ever since and I'm so grateful to you both. Um, I'm also grateful that my long-term friend, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Skip, uh, is with me today uh, to moderate this discussion. Honestly, over the span of a career like mine, the privilege of knowing individuals of such quality, import, and reach has made all the difference in the world to me. So when people ask me, how I do what I do, I'm able to do it because of friends like these. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to um, have a conversation. Thank you, Ruth. That was, that was marvelous. Um, let's go back to the beginning. I was just thinking. If I'm recalling correctly, you took your PhD here in 1973? Is that right? Yes. 
facts. 50 years later, could you, 50 years ago, could you ever imagine returning here in this context? Of course not. I mean, I, I was saying to Larry earlier, I mean, I was an, I was an oddball here. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. I mean, I know. I mean, people, people still ask me today, I mean, what are you doing taking a PhD in French, right? <laughs> so, so I was an oddball in my department. Uh, they didn't, the faculty didn't know what I was doing there or why I was there, and they didn't have much confidence that um, it was going to end well for me uh, uh, because they said that they, they couldn't see a career path for me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the wonderful thing is that it didn't matter uh, what they thought <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, even then I, I was on a path to do something with my life because I had seen through my parents and others, what it meant not to have the opportunity to think for yourself, to do what you thought important, mm -hmm. to have the means to do that. And I knew that Harvard would give me certain means um, to do something constructive, mm -hmm. though I never imagined it would take me as far as it has, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought I'd be able to do something and um, Harvard has been uh, very close to me for a long time, uh, and I was very forgiving of it mm -hmm. uh, for many years uh, because I understood its value. Even if Harvard didn't understand its value, I understood it mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept that very close to me for, for many, many years, uh, understanding that I had gotten something here that could not ever be erased. Mm -hmm. And so that's of great value to the students who come here, that they're able to absorb so much um, and to go out and to do the work that needs to be done in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's not what you ask, but. No, but it's, uh, a, great, that, yeah, it's, a, so. uh, it's a great answer. Um, you launched the Slavery Project at Brown in the very early days of your presidency. And to go back to Nellie McKay's um, <laughs> Our, our dear friend, mutual friend, Nellie McKay, who also took a PhD. Yes, I do. Um, here. Um, what were you thinking? I mean, literally, what possessed you to do that, especially given the fact you were the very first black president of an Ivy League institution? I have a feeling if you'd called John Hope Franklin and said, should I do that, he would say, he what are you know, thinking? Yeah, no, no, yeah. do that in your second uh, term, right? Yeah, yeah. I. I think that I, I, I see things very simplistically, mm -hmm. thank God. My, my family always says, you know, they're very, they're very suspicious of me okay. because I have a PhD. Uh -huh. And they talk a lot about common sense. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've worked very hard to preserve a sense of reality. Mm -hmm. um, and I. I, I basically keep, keep, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's very simple. People ask how, about this issue of brown and slavery, and they needed an answer. I was not going to invent one. <laughs> so what did we need to do? We needed to get to the bottom of it. And, um, and so it was actually just that, just that simple. What wasn't quite so simple is convincing the community that it was that simple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because nobody thought it could possibly be that simple. Nobody knew me mm -hmm. very well at the moment. And so uh, I thought it was fair for them to think that it, there was some kind of subterfuge, that I was really after something, um, you know, uh, and so forth. But, um, and I never worried about the fact which I now see that it could have ended my presidency mm -hmm. as it began. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think about that either. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was uh, risky, and I go back to Har Harvard gave me that because I've never lacked self-confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's clear. <laughs> and so, so if it could have done that, so be it. As long as mm -hmm. I was doing something worthy mm -hmm. 
That's what meant something to me. And so um, early on, um, when you know all the newspaper articles started um, uh, questioning what it was all about, um, I just I just held on uh, to the idea that this is what universities should represent. Mm -hmm. And I just kept explaining that that's what we were doing and, and so on. So it took uh, some years before people uh, settled down, but one critical thing happened um, early on, and it was that the New York Historical Society mm -hmm. decided to do an exhibition on slavery. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that was a big, I remember that the um, CEO of Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. um, mentioned to me, the New York Historical Society is doing an exhibition on slavery in New York. In New York. They were floored by it. Mm -hmm. And so things started happening like that. And suddenly, okay, well maybe, you know, maybe it's not poisonous mm -hmm. to, to seek the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, uh, again, I, I think that the alumni were very quiet. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a, an action taken on for the alums. Um, they were very quiet for a long time, waiting to see what the outcome would be. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I'm amazed by now is that in spite of this going on, you know, I was, I was performing my duties mm -hmm. like everybody else. Um, like I was su supposed to, and um, and you know wasn't worried about how this was going to come out. Did you imagine? <clears throat> could you imagine at the time that undertaking that study might be remembered as historic, as precedent setting, and as a signal moment, uh, not only in your uh, tenure as president, but in fact over the course of your entire career? Absolutely not. Mm. I didn't think it would be that important in in my uh, uh, you know in in how people thought about my my career. I thought you know doing engineering at Smith might be. <laughs> uh, I thought um, uh, Brown going need blind uh, after so many years might be. But I didn't think this would have that impact. And yet it's turned out to be the most cited thing about my work, uh, actually, probably in my whole career. Isn't that <laughs> ironic? It, it is. Uh, but, but we don't get to decide how people will view us. No. We don't get to decide what is worth something for others. Mm -hmm. We just do the work that we do, um, believing in it and hoping that it has good outcomes. That's all we need to do, really. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then let other people decide what they think. So you can sleep at night. So you can sleep yeah. soundly at night. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, Ruth, what were the biggest surprises, both positively and negatively? And part two is, <clears throat> if you had to do it all over again, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently, if anything? Well, certainly the biggest surprise was that it was such a big deal mm -hmm. um, because, you know, in universities, we do this kind of work all the time. We love committees. <laughs> and uh, we set up committees to do all kinds of different things, right? Right. And when I was at Princeton all those years, uh, I did a lot of committees. And so, uh, so I didn't expect the storm, um, that's for sure. Um, I underestimated greatly the whole meaning of being an African American president of an Ivy League university. Mm -hmm. I, I know, call me foolish for that, but um, I didn't think it was such a big deal. I thought that's an accident of history. Come on, um, I happen to be African American, mm -hmm. and by the way, I was available for Harvard too. <laughs> 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 Missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. <laughs> but I don't know. I just, I, I just don't. I just, I'm always a little bit taken aback over this issue of race, mm -hmm. uh, because as much as I was imbued with this whole notion of people, people's hatred for diff for people who are different, mm -hmm. uh, I never 
felt that myself. Mm. And so it's a, always a little bit of a surprise to me when people notice mm -hmm. these things. And so it, it, it was jarring sometimes when people say, well, you know, you're, you're black. Um, <laughs> and you're, you know, you are president of an Ivy League university. I mean, so what? <laughs> Um, so, so that surprised me that that came out like gangbusters. Um, um, you see, this is what happens if you appoint a black person to a role like this. Mm -hmm. This is what they do, <laughs> you know? Because it's, yeah, this is what they do. It's always, you know, <laughs> uh, one, one uh, incorporator at Brown, um, you know, wanted to talk to me about this issue and, and she said, you know, what is it with blacks? You know, why do they have such a chip on their shoulder? So I know that there's this whole feeling that um, there is welled up within us a deep resentment of everything that has happened to black people over the centuries. I know that that is something that people believe. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when they see uh, race, they think, oh my God, this is really gonna be bad, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and so forth, but, um, but I just, I try to keep that as far away from myself as I can. My students sometimes, um, at Brown and at Smith in particular, would ask me, why aren't you angry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you angry? Mm. Why do you expect me to be angry? Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we encounter across time and in the history of the world, what does anger do for us? Mm -hmm. Not much, Not I think. Much. Um, and so I have always, since, since uh, you know, uh, when I was young, and I was in, I was immersed in this racial hatred in in the South, I thought, okay, let me see what I can do personally that will remove this tendency from myself. And so I got on a Greyhound bus and went to Mexico hmm. to live with a Mexican family and to study Spanish. Hmm. And I, that I've always been looking for uh, ways to work on myself. Mm -hmm. If we just work on ourselves you know, and stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and how they're falling short, boy, we'd be better off. So I just work on myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. What surprised you? The biggest positive surprise, the biggest surprise of a positive effect of the study. I think almost certainly um, that when the report was issued, um, and you know, as presidents, we go around the country uh, to alumni clubs and, and so forth, the reaction of alumni, mm -hmm. the sense of pride they had in the fact that this report was done. Hmm. And the, the fact that they um, were, it, it, it reinforced their sense of how progressive the university was, hmm. as opposed to um, making them feel bad about the university. Because mm -hmm. what we wanted to emphasize in the report was our dedication um, to uh, revealing the, the truth um, and how important that was as an underlying value in all the work that we do in universities. And, and so I, I would often use that in exhortations to students about what they should be doing and how they should work and, and how, how they should think about their lives. Uh, nothing's more valuable than for universities to show that they're actually doing what they're asking students to do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What would you do differently in retrospect? Anything at all? And this is very important for us as a university at this moment, of course. I, I think I would have pressed the corporation more mm -hmm. because it was too easy, my being African-American, it was too easy for the incorporators to say, oh no, we're not gonna touch this. Mm -hmm. You do it, mm -hmm. you're black, mm -hmm. um, you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that was too easy uh, for the corporation to do. 
and that I thought it would be much more meaningful to the community if the corporation actually had more of, uh, of a role. So, so here's the thing that I think is important in all of these settings. Um, we don't always get everything right. Uh, goodness knows we have our share of stumbles. Uh, but what we tout is the way in which we work together. We put our minds together, we do research, um, we try to be thoughtful, and we come up with a result. And it's not good for people to sit on the sidelines when that happens, because mm -hmm. if you have a community process, it's the community mm -hmm. making that judgment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I would feel better today if, you know, if I knew that the whole of the corporation mm -hmm. was in that with both feet mm -hmm. as I was. Do you think it was important that every member of the corporation signed Tobiko's report? Um, I think it's, ex it's extraordinary that they did it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, maybe you can tell me how that happened. Back out I mean, threatened to fire them. That's what <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I can't even imagine. Well, first of all, you have fewer uh, incorporators than Brown does. Brown, How many do, does Brown uh, have? It, it's. I would say it's thirty. Oh yeah, we yeah. have fewer than. So so a, a small, a small. Twelve. Yeah. So twelve is nothing. So. <laughs> so, so if you got twelve, you know you can you can jawbone people, you can hold their hands, you can do a lot of different things, um, and so forth. But I think that I think that is extraordinary um, for the corporation have to have been willing uh, to do that. It doesn't matter that people will dislike it. It doesn't matter that people will disagree. Um, uh, it's important to listen to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and to continue to forge a kind of commonality of uh, viewpoint about the responsibility of this university to every, first of all, to the country, mm -hmm. to the communities that it serves, uh, to the values that it upholds. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. And so, um, so you know, I've, I've been very lucky in my presidencies. I've had three now. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's been so wonderful about them is that I have been forgiven so often, so often for things that I've done. Hmm. And I think the reason that I've been forgiven is because people understand my motives. They understand why I do what I do. And it's OK for me to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it's OK for universities sometimes to err. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so. Heaven forbid that we would go about our work being afraid to do bold things, being afraid to do things that might benefit the community or benefit our students or benefit knowledge because we are afraid that people will be mm -hmm. upset about it. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, any university worth its salt um, has to be willing to have a president uh, and uh, a board of trustees that steps out on that limb. Mm -hmm. yep, absolutely. That's great. Ruth, two more questions, and then um, if we have time, we'll uh, open it up. Literally every generational African American descends from enslaved ancestors. Every. But few of us, like you, actually know the names of our enslaved ancestors. Um, which you know because you had your family tree created. In fact, you know the names of four enslaved great-grandparents on your father's, on your mother's side, the oldest born in 1836 in North Carolina, and four um, great-grandparents on your father's side, the oldest born in 1843 in Kentucky. You even know the name of the man who owned one of your great-grandfathers, a man named Charles Beasley, a cotton farmer in Houston County, Texas, near where you actually grew up, and who also is a genetic ancestor of yours. Did your own background as a descendant of enslaved women and men influence your decision to undertake this project? And how do you deal with people who say, slavery, slavery, wasn't that so long ago? Get over it. You're just adding fuel to the fire of the right. Yeah, I, I think that um, that knowledge came to me uh, much later, uh, the identi identity of those uh, individuals, and so at the time I was doing this at Brown, I certainly didn't know that genealogy. Um, 
but I certainly knew growing up in the town where I was that um, there, there were lies written on the faces of people in the town. Um, mm. Because, uh, of course, you know, it's, you all, everybody knows. Everybody knows that this person actually is a blood relative, mm -hmm. although they're white, mm -hmm. and, um, and things are strictly segregated. And there can be no commerce between you, and yet you know that that person is your relative. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, that certainly was not in my mind. Um, I, I think probably the thoughts that I've had about that have come very much later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, and because it's, it's, it's meaningful to me now, um, in a sense, because um, there are things that I want my children to know, there are things that I want uh, my grandchild uh, to know. And, um, and so, that it, it, so I, I spend a good deal of time thinking about it now, but I wasn't at that moment mm -hmm. thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I never really wanted to be a leader, let me say that. Hmm. Um, partly because early on I felt unworthy mm -hmm. to be a leader, and partly, be, be, uh, partly because I thought of myself as a kind of uh, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My job was to speak the truth, mm -hmm. and I didn't think that could be ever respected. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I tell the story often about my time at Princeton, when it was pretty clear to me um, uh, that, you know, I, when I walk down the sidewalk, people will cross over to the other side so they wouldn't have to speak to me. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and I understand that because I was constantly telling people um, how wrong they were and what they should, <laughs> what they should be doing. I was, I was really a horrible. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, it, it never occurred to me that a university would want somebody like me to be its leader, mm -hmm. because I would be uh, too off-putting um, uh, to, um, to people. So when Smith came and said, you know, would you consider this, I, I said no, mm -hmm. no, because I thought they really didn't know about me, <laughs> um, and, and so on. So my very good friend Aaron Lemonick, um persuaded me that I had to take that presidency. Um, uh, because he said I was being foolish and uh, I really was um, not confident enough to do it and so forth. So I fi finally did it. But, mm -hmm. but what was your question again? I, <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that if we're very fortunate, and I feel very fortunate, um, we get to live our fantasies. Mm -hmm. And I've most wanted to do something constructive. I've most wanted to be able to demonstrate that care and concern for other people is a magnificent uh, calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've most wanted to demonstrate that all the things that we think of as being important actually aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother and father never had anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, magnificent human beings. Mm -hmm. And I had that secret. I carried that around, that I knew that people could be magnificent and have nothing. Mm -hmm. And so... I've wanted my students to understand that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've really focused my efforts on rather than trying to show them anything dazzling. Because mm -hmm. I don't dazzle. You dazzle. Bruce. No, no, you, I don't. You, I don't. So, so, so that's, that's the thing that's meaningful uh, to me, is, is to be a person mm -hmm. um, who is authentic, mm -hmm. who cares about people, um, who uh, eliminates the barriers that people so commonly find to divide themselves from others, mm -hmm. and who seeks rigorously and consistently to just 
do good, and do justice. It's a very simple, as I said, I'm very simplistic in the way I think about life, and that's the way I think about it. And you exemplify it so brilliantly, without a doubt. Final question. You occupy a unique historical position, both as a graduate of an HBCU, as well as an Ivy League institution, Dillard and Harvard, as well as the only person in the history of the academy who has served as a president of an Ivy League university and the president of an HBCU. Uh, Brown and Pravey. So, Ruth, what do you think might be the most meaningful gestures and programs for our university to undertake in the wake of Tomiko's uh, committee's report, both short term and long term? Well, frankly, at, you know. Um As we heard this morning, HBCUs have been consigned to a space in higher education that is one of those stories that we should be very ashamed of. Mm -hmm. First of all, we weren't supposed to be able to learn because we were genetically um, unfit um, for higher level learning. Um, and then when schools were created for us, they were supposed to be less than. Um, and because they were supposed to be less than, they couldn't be funded um, on a scale similar to uh, the institutions that were meant for whites. That's the story, basically, of HBCUs in this country. And that needs to be set right. Mm. Um, they are no longer just for African Americans, because uh, more and more students come to HBCUs um, because they think it's the right place for them. And so how long that legacy will last, I don't, I don't know. Hmm. But what I do know is that in um, our country, as educators, as educators, we divide up educational opportunity in a shameful way. Hmm. We say that someone from a certain area, from a certain school, is less likely to be able to perform at a high level in a very competitive environment. And we take that for granted, and we let lots of decisions be made on that basis. Shameful. Um, and so I came from uh, a tiny black college uh, to Harvard. And um, I think nobody here really expected me to perform that well. Hmm. Um, that's the way it's been for a long time. Hmm. So, so what can we do? First of all, we can admit these institutions into the community of higher education for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is inordinately important to me, that that be done. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, um, when you admit them to the community of higher education, that means you've got to you've got to advocate for appropriate funding, especially for the state institutions. We are a state university, and um, advocating for uh, appropriate funding. Well, just imagine it. It's Texas. Um, and advocating for appropriate funding in the environment that we're in is very, uh, is very challenging to do. But what can we do in the meantime? Institutions like Harvard can do what this report recommends be done, and that is invite us into the community of scholarship, invite us into the community of research, um, and allow those partnerships to lift these institutions in ways that they've never really had a chance to be lifted. Mm -hmm. That's what I think can be done. Mm. Amen to that. Wow. Now, wasn't that dazzling? It was wonderful. Thank you.